Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Benton and um, today I am so excited and so honored and grateful to be here and being able to present to you the research that I've done all semester long on Betty Boop and gender colonization during the Great Depression. And so if there's somebody who doesn't know who Betty Boop is out there, um, she's right there, that's Betty Boop. And she's created by these two brothers pictured up above, Max and Dave Fleischer. They were both animators during a key um, stage in animation called the Golden Age of Animation. This was around the time when it was just beginning. Another famous figurehead at that time is Walt Disney, just to kind of give you a reference point there. Um, it is important to note too that uh, Max Fleischer was the main producer guy. That's why he gets the credits in being able to hold Betty Boop and kind of kiss her there in that picture. And Dave Fleischer was a director. He was kind of the one who ultimately made the decisions in regards to what was going to be in her films and what wasn't going to be in her films. Um, Betty Boop herself starred um, in short films that were shown in movie theaters, and she graced the big screen for nine years and in 119 short films, all of which I watched, by the way, for this research. And um, the crazy thing about that, and that's something that should not be overlooked, is that people were going to the movie theaters during the Great Depression. They didn't have very much money to feed themselves, they didn't have very much money to sustain a home, but they were willing to splurge a little bit of money to go to the big screen and watch um, Betty Boop on there. And the reason why is because Betty Boop gave them a beacon of light and a little bit of hope in their lives. Um, she was nostalgic in the fact that she was a flapper girl, and flapper girls came from a previous generation and a carefree generation where people could party, they could drink when there wasn't a prohibition on alcohol going on. And um, she's also cute and little and sweet, and she eats a lot of ice cream, weirdly enough, and people weren't able to eat ice cream, they weren't able to party. And so that was something that really attracted audiences to her. Um, something that's never said in the films, but that I want to highlight, is the fact that she's like 16 years old. And um, as a 16 year old in the Great Depression, she doesn't live with her parents. Her parents are maybe mentioned in one or three of the short films. They do not have a good relationship, by the way. And um, as a 16 year old living on her own in a big city, she lives in a small apartment and um, she just kind of is making her way and trying to um, navigate like her own life and finding a job for herself. And she uses her beauty to um, help her get employed. And she also navigates the terrible men that are in all of her short films. Um, I also want to mention, of course, that Betty Boop is a cartoon. I am very aware of this. But her cartoonness is key to understanding her because it allows her, or really the Fleischer brothers, to present more um, things in their cartoons. They're able to get away with more things because it could be seen as lighthearted jokes rather than um, serious things that were up for discussion. Oh, and before I move on from this slide, this was um, the very first um, Betty Boop film. And back at, during this time, this is like 1930, um, Betty Boop and all other characters had a lot more animalistic features. And I think we're all grateful for the developments that turned that into that. <laughs> and um, one key aspect of my um, paper in this presentation is the idea of gender colonization. And gender colonization is a force and an ongoing process that we still see in society today um, that tries to tell people and tell women how they should act and um, how they should um, function in society and really who they should be. Um, we see this in films, we see this in magazines, really anything that tells you um, that you and your gender are supposed to look and act a certain way, that's gender colonization. And um, colonization throughout time has utilized the idea of gender um, as a way of stabilizing or bolstering or defending communities um, in order for those communities to thrive. And so the idea is that as long as mom, the mom or the woman stays at home and does all the chores, makes tons of babies, and is an ornament to her husband, society can function as a whole. And this was something that was definitely true during the Great Depression as well. Even though women were encouraged to um, go further into the workplace to help bring a little bit of money home. It's important to know too that um, gender colonization is something that interacts with culture a lot. And that is, once again, like the idea of films and um, music and all these things that are products of deliberate and systematic choices to place people into certain roles and tell them how they should behave. Before I move on from this slide, I want to tell you briefly about um, what the Hays Code is. And that is a code that was created around 1935 by Hollywood. Um, that's like a censorship code. And this code was created um, because of the, the demands of the government and of um, the Catholic Legion of um, Decency that both said that these films are too violent, or not that it was films, but films are too violent or they're too sexual, that there's too many suggestive elements in there and that things needed to be toned down for the audiences. And there wasn't much of like a rating system back then and so that's kind of like why they um, felt the Hays Code needed to come into place. 
And Betty Boop is really affected by the Hayes Code because she went from skimpy short dress and um, talking a lot about risque things to kind of wearing homemaker outfits and rescuing puppies. And so my main arguments and methods, um, I wanted to first tell you about the research question I assessed, which is what messages did the Betty Boop short films send to audiences, both child and adult, because remember, children were seeing these films as well as adults, um, about the proper way that men should treat women and the way that we should define a woman's value. And I argue that um, the Fleischer brothers were active participants in gender colonization and that they helped foster an acceptance of predatory male behavior towards women and that they helped proliferate a message that a woman's value lies only in her physical beauty, not in her intelligence or other capabilities. And um, out of the 119 films that I watched, I chose to focus on Boop Boop a Doop, Betty Boop's Big Boss, Betty Boop for President, and Judge for a Day. Each of these films have um, these really strong key messages about the way that um, men should treat women, and um, they all, to some degree, show um, the things that make Betty Boop valuable, which is mainly her face. They um, make fun of Betty Boop's intelligence throughout all of these. And so um, part of my title of my paper, my presentation, is the idea of Boop Boop a Doop. And um, it's her catchphrase. And I want to look deeper into this of like, what does this mean in terms of these films? Outside of the films, um, people have defined it like a scat that you hear in jazz songs or a nonsensical term of sometimes risque connotations or a silly little catchphrase or filler word. But in terms of the Betty Boop cartoons, it refers most of the time to her sexual appeal, her virginity itself, or her other sexual activities. And it does this in an indirect and um, displaced way. And this, defining this term is crucial because she says it in every cartoon. We want to know what she's talking about. And also, her name is Betty Boop after all. So it's good to know where the name comes from. And um, the example that I'm about to show you is from the short film Boop Boop a Doop. Um, let me show you just a little photo of that going back. With the really creepy picture right there of the man filling up her leg, I'm about to show you that film. And we're going to all cringe together and it's going to be wonderful. But um, before I show you that clip from that film, um, I'll give you a little bit of background context. Um, during this film, Betty Boop joins the circus, and she is a lion tamer and a tightrope walker and singer. This woman can do so much. She's kind of putting us all in the poor place. Um, her interactions with the lions are interesting, and um, they discuss a lot of like different relational aspects between men and women. I don't have time to talk about that or um, discuss that with you all, but I hope somebody will ask me a question about it because I do talk about it in my paper. Um, there is one other female, a part of the circus, and well, you know, we know that Betty Boop was one of the women, but um, there is a lady there who we only know as the fat lady, and she um, is standing on this little cart, and there's somebody inflating her to make her bigger and bigger and bigger, and in this way, they dehumanize her. They say that because she has more weight to her, that she is not a beautiful woman, that she may not even be a woman, that she might just be something um, to laugh at or some animalistic, just not worthy of attention thing. That is one um, instance where they make fun of a fat lady in this cartoon or somebody who um, you would say has more weight to them than skinny little Betty Boop. But there's also um, going to be somebody in the audience I want you guys to watch out for. and. Um, it is a woman who goes to sit down, and um, she has this little tiny clock that she sits down on, and she looks more like an animal than she does human. They make her look more like a cow, and that is also the Fleischer's way of jabbing at women again, saying that if you're not skinny and you don't look like Betty Boop, then you may as well be a cow. And um, that was the only way to the Fleischer brothers that women were beautiful, was that they're super skinny and had sexual appeal. All right, here comes nothing. I hope you enjoyed this little clip to the best of your ability. And I also want to encourage you too to pay attention to the song lyrics that Betty Boop is about to sing because that is going to also explain a lot about the idea of Boo 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 Doop itself.
their tool for like getting a job or um, maintaining some sort of like economic stability was using their sexuality to entice men. And um, the, the Betty Boop cartoons, they talk a lot about this and they make a lot of jokes about it, but um, they like acknowledge a problem about admitting it's a problem and showing um, what happened to many women where they just blinked at a guy or did their job correctly. They um, were in danger of sexual assault like this. But because this was also the Great Depression, and because um, the legal system did trust men more than they trusted women, they had very minimal resources to go to in order to report these events and um, gain some sort of safety. I think my little thing cut off there. Let me get back to the next slide. There we go. And so, um, some observations from the film that I mentioned earlier were um, about the cow like audience member who represented women that were overweight. And um, we, I want to acknowledge a lot of the things that the ringleader did um, when he assaulted Betty Boop and threatening her job and ignored entirely the idea of consent. And um, we, um, I also want to acknowledge again that the idea of Boop 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 um, is used almost in describing her job or the music she was singing, but the music she was singing itself was very sexual and was encouraging the idea of taking her Boop Boop Boop, boop away. And um, so ultimately, even if we were to look at this term as like, oh, like, boop, 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 that's just her job. Like, it's still ultimately referring to the idea of uh, her sexual activities. And um, also, he literally grabs her by the butt and drags her into the tent. So that kind of speaks for itself, too. Um, and this film, as all the Betty Boop films, were intended to be funny to audiences, and they all laughed. And we feel the effects and the repercussions of their laughter today as we still deal with um, this predatory behavior of men in um, the workplace. That's why we have the Me Too movement. And um, the clown does say her name, as I mentioned, but um, the thing about when the clown saves her, it's heroic, it's funny. And um, at the end, after he's all done saving her and they're holding each other in their arms, um, the clown asks her, did he take your boop boop a dupe away? And she says, no. And um, it ends in a way that says that Betty Boop is ultimately going to give the clown her boop boop a dupe for saving her. And this teaches men that like, if you save a woman from a situation, or if you find a woman who is in a vulnerable position, that you can um, take advantage of that situation in order to please your own sexual desires. And that is all I have for you guys today. Are there any <coughs> questions, comments, eye rolls? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked about that. So, as I mentioned before, Betty Boop was a lion tamer at one point during the circus. Go, Richie But um, 
the lions, when she's in there, she's, you know, trying to whip them back and making sure they don't attack her or anything like that. And the lions themselves are acting wild and they're roaring. And then at one point, the lions lean over to each other and speak in English and they're like, my roar is louder than your roar. And the one other lion goes, no, my roar is louder than your roar. And Betty Boop is just enjoying and having a grand old time. And that's the message that the more you roar, the more you act wild or um, have this kind of primitive behavior towards women, the more that, yeah, they might whip you, but they ultimately like the behavior you're examining. And that's also shown in the contrast of this one gentle lion that comes up to her. He just is going like that. And um, he taps her on the shoulder and says, excuse me. And you know, she's like, uh-huh. And he opens the door for her and lets her out. And um, Betty Boop does not really, I mean, she's like, thank you, but she's not really attracted to this lion that she doesn't really show any approval of his actions. And that says that any man who shows manners or is a gentleman is not attractive to women. Any other questions? Um, so I, I had I had a question. You, you, you actually, because I, I had a question and you kind of answered it, but I wanted to see if you answered it. So I, I was um, so when you mentioned in that in that clip you showed, I talked about how uh, how uh, Betty got saved at the end, mm -hmm. and then um, and so basically my question was like, do you think this was like more of a call to action against that kind of issue at the time, or do you think it was kind of more satire? And then obviously you know you gave, you gave an answer, or, or kind of where you answered it was like it was the Saving was like your way of getting like the the the, the, the new. Um, but do you think like that itself was like more satire yes. the issue rather than the call action? Absolutely. And um, there's more um, cartoons where men try to save um, Betty Boop from grosser men, and um, they never really like display it as saving. Like every effort that's made to save her, like I didn't show you the rest of the clip, but like you know, there's like a fighting going on between the big blueberry ringmaster and um, the little clown. And like at one point the clown tries to shoot the ringmaster out of a cannonball. Like there's all these exaggerated efforts that were intended to make the audiences laugh and um, mock at this idea of like, oh, like she's being rescued, but look at how, I mean, for lack of a better word, extra this is. Yes? So out of all, because you watch all the episodes, what did you choose these ones in particular? So let me go back to, um, photo on here. Okay, so um, I watched them in chronological order. There are some ones from the very beginning, like the 1930s, I did want to mention, but the only things that were really um, fascinating about those is the fact that they kept trying to get Betty Boop's clothes off her. Like, she would be sleeping and then, oops, her bra just magically flew in the air. And like, that was funny in a sense and disgusting in a sense, but not rich in analysis. I chose all four of these because they're very rich for analysis. And like we saw the clip just now from um, Boo 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 Doop, and it's interesting seeing just the very obvious way he's rubbing up and down her leg and the fact that she says no and is sobbing as um, she runs away from him. In the big boss, that's very um, similar to things going on in the Me Too movement. She says no, but then she calls the police and the police come, but then the Navy come and the military come, like planes of people come to save her. But then at the end, um, she starts kissing the big boss and um, when they're like, are you okay? She's like, fresh. And she puts the window shutters down so she can have some privacy with her boss. And um, Betty Boop for president, she um, runs for president for her campaign. Like if you hear the economic propositions she's making, they're very not logical and they're satiring and making fun of the fact that she knows nothing about politics. And um, she's mainly getting votes because she's Betty Boop and she's sexual and people like the idea of voting for something that's more attractive rather than something that's more logical. And then I chose Judge for a day because this is the only time that the um, Fleischer brothers get in there and um, they show the inconveniences that women face, such as sitting next to a man who won't stop talking to you or trying to take a shower in your apartment, but oh, your neighbor next door used all the hot water. And so they go through these very um, convoluted punishments for these um, perpetrators of these minor inconveniences. But what's interesting about this is the fact that those minor conveniences were pointed out that, hey, how about Betty Boop almost got raped just now? How come nobody's um, making any problems about that? And so um, that contrast is fascinating, as well as the notion that anytime a woman complains, that she's just being dramatic. And I'm trying to think, Aaron. Um, out of curiosity, just for, you know, this is super early, the world of animation and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I I think you're right in the sense that Betty Boop is definitely like the most obvious example 
of this kind of behavior in these depictions in animation. I was wondering if there were any other examples of that that you'd be able to contrast. If, if this yeah. were like a perception at the times, or is this just what the Fleischers were able to get away with? Kind of a thing? So Betty Boop is the most sexualized example um, of this during the golden age of animation. I mentioned Walt Disney at one point during yeah. my um, thing. This paper is gonna be very close to being Betty Boop and Minnie Mouse during this time, but there was not enough um, secondary history um, literature on this. Um, but if you watch like the early Minnie Mouse cartoons, like she in some ways is sexualized. And then she becomes sexualized, and then she um, goes through the Hays Code, and then she becomes a little mini homemaker. And so we see that there as well. Although I don't have the evidence with me to show that, it's oh, still exists and it's fascinating to look at that way. Franklin? Yes, um, anything on why the Fleshers chose Betty as their main character despite the hyper-masculine chivalry and the, the heroes that come and save her? Um, something that I do discuss in my paper a lot is the idea of sex selling. People um, want to feed that part of their appetite. And um, before Betty Boop, they had some cartoons. Oh, I can't remember the name of them right now. But um, they had a key, a key, yeah. A character named um, Bimbo and there's these really brief cartoons that are more for kids but they needed somebody like Betty Boop in order to make their animation studios more popular in that sense does that answer your question mm -hmm. and then did you have a question Dr. O'Gorman? I do I, first I want to thank you very much for your presentation oh. I really enjoyed it yeah. I wanted to suggest that maybe you know slightly more interesting contrast with the one um, cartoon figure female figure I think was more famous than and it's different in some fascinating ways, but that's um, the orphan Annie, where we have somebody who also doesn't age. She's a couple of years younger and is very cool. Um, her creator spends a great deal of the 30s lambasting Roosevelt and all of his um, anti-depression methods and doing it through both Danny Warbucks and the little orphan Annie. Um, but I think you might still find that using this lens, which is fascinating, of gender colonization, you get some interesting statements about what it is that a slightly younger, possibly pre-sexualized young girl is supposed to do that I think you, you just have some fascinating ways for comparison. I don't know, have you had a chance to look at her at all? I have not. Uh, I will have to like look into like ways of watching her short films. God is really good to me in the fact that all Betty Boop's films were on YouTube. To be clear, she's just a comic strip. Oh, she is? Okay. So I can remember there's like a, an animation feature. A different, there may be some, I think there's some live action as well, Ooh. but primarily her story, her evolution through the comic strip would be the way to took it, which is more work, for, but I don't know if that's something. Oh, that would be interesting, and like I could also continue to compare that to Betty Boop, because something I didn't mention is the fact that she was on short films, but she was also a comic strip. And so um, being able to compare like those pieces of evidence would be fascinating. Thorne. So you mentioned how Benny Boop served both as like this beacon of light in the uh, and then we also like get these examples of like really bad things happening to her. I was curious if you were able to find any other people that were analyzing you know, these uh, cartoons or films, and if there was a difference in, the, in analysis based on gender. Absolutely. Um, most of the content I found, like, and that discussed Betty Boop was mostly in praise of the Fleischer Brothers and their innovations through uh, the golden age of animation. There was not too many voices in terms of historiography that were directly uh, criticizing like what they did. Um, the only other voice that really is kind of starting to question um, these short films was by a woman whose name I cannot remember right now, but she looked at it from the lens of Betty Boop's Jewishness um, in comparison like to like these films rather than the aspect of gender. In which I wanted to say too, um, for half the semester, I was convinced I was going to put some racial appropriation and um, to this paper because there is evidence of that as well in the Betty Boop films. But um, when I got started on this piece of gender, I just felt like there was so much to talk about that um, I need to make a dissertation if I had to add that aspect of it too. Yes. Uh, did you find anything about like the person who voiced Betty Boop? Yes. Um, so Mae West was like the main woman who voiced her. I didn't look too much into her history, but um, before like, I continue on to another question, I want to tell you about the fact that there was a lot of controversy around the idea of who inspired Betty Boop. And I, my best understanding of it was there was an um, African-American singer named Baby Esther. I think it's Baby Esther Jones. And she was a jazz singer. And like, you know, she had the short hair, and she sang boop, 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 boop in her songs. 
from what I know from there, there's a woman named Helen Kane who saw this woman perform and was inspired and brought this to her husband, who ironically enough was Max Fleischer. That kind of got the Betty Boop idea started, but Helen and Max divorced, and there's a whole bunch of lawsuits that occurred from there as far as an inspiration for Betty Boop, or I want Betty Boop's money, ultimately, kind of thing. And so like this got into the courts, this was a really big thing in the newspapers, um, but ultimately it's also like a divorce level. Um, I just want to mention that as well. Yes? Uh, I'm really curious about the age thing, and especially how that plays into like gender colonization. Because I, I, I mean, I feel like a huge thing, at least like with, with women and beauty standards, it is looking young and not looking older and always being young. Do you think that was um, like intentional, like her age being kind of vague and everything? Or Absolutely. like, did anyone touch on that? Or I don't know. There wasn't a lot of scholarship that touched on that. Honestly, the way I found out her age was by the lovely conspiracy theorists online. We really need to give them a round of applause in general. But um, the idea of her being younger and her age being ambiguous did make it so she was more approachable to audiences. But um, something that I discovered with um, Betty Boop is like kind of like the notion of like, you know, we always do want to look young and beautiful. But then there's a time when you're like 16 and you're trying to look older and beautiful. And so I think um, Betty Boop in her young age, she's trying to act more mature and she's trying to be older in her actions and in the way she presents herself. But um, in some of the earlier films, she gets into these squabbles of her parents and then she's like, I'm gonna run away from home. And her parents are like, you go for it, Betty. And she's exasperated with her, and, like what they thought was her immaturity. And um, so we get that like kind of contradictory element of it too. But it is interesting to see the idea of age at play in terms of gender colonization because ultimately, from the time we're little, we're trying to act like we're beautiful and together with it and we think we can gain that by being older. But then there hits like a certain age where we're like, oh no, I can be beautiful and sophisticated if I'm younger. And I wish I knew what that middle point was. I can say 40, but I feel like that's probably wrong. Diane? Yeah, Rachel, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Uh, you know, I've watched many group cartoons over the years, here and there, and, and I must admit that I took them very superficially, past cartoons, and um, you catch a new um, lens um, in your presentation, um, uh, apart from my previous exposure in terms of just, oh, cute cartoons, you know. Oh, okay. well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that, and thank you all for being here today.